How's it going, folks? Welcome back to part two of What If The Levelers Won The British Civil Wars. If you like this video, be sure to leave a like afterwards and share it, as well as give me your feedback in the comments. If you haven't seen part one, I highly encourage you to do so, as you will most likely be lost in part two without the prior context. Now let's get into it. Amidst preparations for a military campaign against Oliver Cromwell in Parliament, the Levellers begin setting up cells of Leveller rebels in rural Britain, far from the scrutinizing eyes of Parliament. The Levellers also utilize these cells to disseminate their ideology throughout Wales to gain the support of the locals, something which was badly needed in their current situation trapped on the Isle of Anglesey. Through these outreach efforts, on January 16, 1648, the Anglesey rebels successfully make contact with intellectuals and government officials in Cardiff, who are sympathetic to the Leveller movement. Through these Welsh sympathizers, the rebels in Anglesey come to learn that a parliamentarian detachment of soldiers garrisoned in Pembroke Castle were on the verge of mutiny after having gone 18 months without a single payment from Parliament. They also learned that the Royalists had already begun making overtures to encourage the Pembroke garrison to switch to their side. With this information in mind, a small group of leveller intellectuals and soldiers departed Anglesey on January 25, 1648. This group of levellers, led by Colonel Robert Lilburn himself, reached Pembroke Castle the next day, travelling by night to avoid parliamentarian patrols. Once they arrived, they arranged for a meeting with Colonel Rowland Lafarn, Colonel Rice Powell, and Colonel John Poyer, who spoke on behalf of the unpaid soldiers. Colonel Lilburn appealed to the men regarding their mutual enemy in Parliament. Lilburn stressed that while things are as bad as they ever were under Parliament, returning to the service of the King was not viable for Britain moving forward. Lilburn gave copies of the Agreement of the People for the men to read, and delivered to them the Leveller's vision for a new England, free of tyrants and poverty. Inspired by Lilburn's words, the mutinous soldiers hold a vote, and by a margin of two to one, the soldiers choose to ally with the Levellers instead of the Royalists, as they did in our timeline. Combined, the Pembroke garrison consisted of nearly 9,000 men. With the Pembroke mutineers voting to join the Levellers, a new era for the movement began. Now able to project their power across the Welsh coast, the Levellers began preparing to launch a military campaign against parliamentarian forces across Wales. Their first order of business was retraining the Pembroke mutineers, who were largely untested and untrained in battle. Likewise, during this time, with their networks of information throughout Britain secure, major levellers, including Richard Overton and Freeborn John, make their way to Wales, having finalized their plans for the future. Freeborn John, the leader of the levellers, arrived in Anglesey on horseback on February 15, 1648. Once there, Freeborn John reunited with his brother and began helping to plan his military campaign, as Richard Overton worked on writing more pamphlets and Gerard Winstanley began work on expanding the leveller-controlled region's agricultural output. On March 1, 1648, the liberation of Wales officially began as the Leveller rebels, christened the Army of the People by Leveller Richard Overton, began marching across northern Wales. By March 8, 1648, the Army of the People had successfully dislodged parliamentarian forces throughout Cunavanshire, Denbyshire, and Flintshire. To the benefit of the Army of the People, Wales had been at peace for nearly the entirety of the civil wars thus far, resulting in only token parliamentarian resistance to the invigorated Leveller forces. With every village captured, the Leveller forces are merciful, focusing on winning over as many hearts and minds as possible. Soon enough, Leveller policies begin to be implemented across Leveller-controlled territory in Wales, which soon becomes known as the Liberated Zone. Leveller reforms include the disbandment of the old feudal order and enfranchisement of the peasantry. Accordingly, land is confiscated from the nobility and redistributed to the peasants. An iconic image of this era of Welsh history comes to be that of a soldier of the army of the people, clad in black fatigues with a sea-green armband on his left arm. Across numerous towns in Wales, the sea-green flag of the Levellers is raised by the soldiers who fight under it. A major factor in the Leveller's rapid territorial gains is the growing discrepancy in quality between the Army of the People and the New Model Army. Although the vast majority of the soldiers of the Army of the People, 
were once members of the New Model Army themselves, the difference is that the Army of the People lived up to its name and they also emphasized friendliness towards the peasants, making it their goal to have positive relations with the people they claimed to serve. On the other hand, to their detriment, the New Model Army suffered from abysmally low morale and usually fought whilst being owed months or years of back pay from Parliament that many died before receiving, or just never received at all. As the 1648 Leveller Spring Offensive sees great success, disturbing reports of a mass peasant revolt in Wales begin to reach London. Oliver Cromwell and Parliament want to act as soon as possible, but they are crippled by the numerous crises they are facing already. Cromwell's army is focused on first handling the resurgent royalist threat, all whilst engager forces in Scotland look to the south, wishing to retake London for King Charles I. Unable to spare extra troops, Oliver Cromwell orders Parliamentarian Colonel Thomas Horton, leader of the New Model Army Detachment in Wales, to crush the uprising utilizing his elite veteran forces. Thus far, Colonel Horton's ability to combat the uprising had been severely affected by the fact that he didn't know how serious the situation was, believing the Leveller Offensive to be nothing more than a minor peasant rebellion. Accordingly, Colonel Horton had been reluctant to commit his forces to stop a minor peasant rebellion when he considered preventing a royalist revolt in pro-royalist Wales more pressing. When Colonel Horton receives Oliver Cromwell's new orders, he is shocked that the so-called peasant rebellion has gotten out of hand so fast. In fact, Leveller undercover agents serving under Colonel Horton in Cardiff had been successfully manipulating his reports for some time now, ensuring that throughout the spring offensive, Colonel Horton had thought nothing was amiss. Following Oliver Cromwell's new orders, Colonel Horton then mobilizes his forces in a desperate effort to stop the army of the people from conquering Wales. Horton's forces and the army of the people clash in several brutal battles across central Wales throughout the spring of 1648. However, the pro-royalist sentiments of the Welsh people resulted in the anti-parliamentarian levellers enjoying the tentative support of the Welsh people, which gave the levellers an edge over the parliamentarians. After all, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, and the levellers disrupting the parliamentarians can only be a good thing, the Welsh royalists had assumed. Many Welsh royalists are confident that as soon as the king is restored in London, he would be able to crush this peasant revolt. Unfortunately, this was not to be the case. With every battle, more and more unpaid and malnourished New Model Army soldiers defect to the army of the people upon hearing of the Leveller's plan for Britain. By May 31st, 1648, the army of the people, commanded by Colonel Robert Lilburn, had reached Cardiff. Its soldiers were battle-hardened, its movement was enjoying high morale and popular support, and its ranks were swelling. This time around, it was the parliamentarians who had engaged in a tactical retreat, following Colonel Horton proclaiming an emergency action which demanded all parliamentarian forces pull back to Cardiff. In just around half a year, the Lovelers had gone from four rebellious regiments fleeing Cromwell's forces to a military and political force more than 15,000 strong. Although Freeborn John offers Colonel Horton the chance to surrender peacefully and even join the army of the people, Colonel Horton remains loyal to Oliver Cromwell and declares his intention to hold Cardiff at any cost. The siege of Cardiff began on June 1st, 1648. Lasting ten days, the siege of Cardiff saw much of the city damaged by fire and many crimes committed by the occupying parliamentarian forces against the anti-parliamentarian citizens of Cardiff. Furthermore, the siege claimed the lives of 2,000 civilians and soldiers. However, despite these hardships, the Lovelers pushed relentlessly against the parliamentarian defenders, weakened and unable to send word to London for reinforcements. On June 11, 1648, Cardiff falls to the army of the people. Colonel Thomas Horton surrenders to Colonel Robert Lilburn and prepares to accept his fate. To his surprise, instead of being hung, drawn, and quartered, Colonel Horton is left unharmed and is instead arrested for crimes against the revolution and taken into military custody. As they entered the ruined city of Cardiff, the army of the people immediately began a relief effort for Cardiff citizens. While Leveller Boots marched through the streets of Cardiff, Freeborn John, flanked by Colonel Lilburn and Richard Overton, raises the sea-green flag of the Levellers over Cardiff Castle. 
Oliver Cromwell and Parliament only learn what has transpired a day later due to Cardiff being on lockdown to prevent any parliamentarians from learning what has transpired. However, despite the best efforts of both the levelers and the locals to prevent anyone from alerting Parliament, a beleaguered bureaucrat loyal to Colonel Horton soon arrives in London with news of the fall of Cardiff. However, even this massive development in the leveler insurgency is not the top priority for the parliamentarians. Throughout the spring and summer of 1648, the parliamentarian government had been rocked by successive crises, including royalist uprisings in Essex, Kent, Cornwall, Cumberland, Northumberland, and Surrey. The fall of Wales had indeed served as a wake-up call to the parliamentarians that what they'd assumed was merely a peasant revolt was indeed something much more serious, but it was already too late. With his army focusing on battling the engagers and struggling to maintain control over England, Oliver Cromwell is left unable to effectively counter the levelers at the present moment. While the levelers grow their influence across Britain, parliamentarian efforts to crush the leveler movement are frustrated by increasing infighting within the parliamentary faction, the threat of the royalist engager armies, and a devastated economy. To prevent multiple crises from spiraling out of control, the parliamentarian government makes one final attempt to destroy the levelers in Wales before combating the engagers. On July 1st, 1648, parliamentarian forces under the command of Major General John Lambert, widely considered one of the finest soldiers of the New Model Army, began their march to Anglesey. Major General Lambert, with 7,000 men under his command, is tasked with crushing the levelers in Wales, with the prime target being their provisional capital of Holyhead, in hopes of killing or apprehending the major leveler leaders. This thinking is driven by the classism of Parliament, with many of its members assuming that simply killing the leaders of the revolt would result in the peasants returning to their place in the social order. However, Lambert's march to Anglesey is an unmitigated disaster. The New Model Army was better equipped and had more men, but it meant that they moved slower and were unable to hide their movement, whilst the level of guerrillas were much stealthier. Lambert's invasion force is constantly harassed by both the civilian populace and leveler guerrilla fighters, who frequently conduct nighttime raids and ambushes, killing men in their sleep, burning food supplies, and stealing horses. All of this begins to take its toll on Lambert's men. The inability to differentiate between the peasants and the guerrillas often led to massacres across Wales throughout Lambert's three-week march. By the time Lambert's men reached Anglesey, the levelers had more of his supplies than he did, Lambert's men were suffering from incredibly low morale and many wished to call off the attack, but Lambert reiterated that they had orders and must carry through. On the morning of July 22, 1648, Lambert begins his attack on Holyhead, facing off against the army of the people, united in defending their home against malnourished and unpaid parliamentarian soldiers. The Battle of Holyhead had begun. Leading the defense of Hollyhead is General John Wildman of the Army of the People. The levelers focus on inflicting as many losses as possible, annihilating entire divisions rather than weakening the army as a whole. The aim of this tactic is to break the enemy's spirit. The battle is brutal, with the best of the Army of the People fighting against Lambert's massive invasion force. However, driven by their will to survive and secure Britain's freedom, as well as enjoying a defensive advantage, the army of the people manages to crush Lambert's forces, routing them. In the chaos, Lambert, struggling to maintain order amongst his ranks, is bludgeoned to death by peasants. The rest of the New Model army under his command either surrenders or flees. As word of the leveler victory at Anglesey spreads, a significant portion of the New Model army throughout England, with whom the levelers were immensely influential, began defecting en masse. The catastrophic defeat at Anglesey and the death of John Lambert is a massive blow to the parliamentarian cause and the army grandees. In our timeline, Lambert was a key figure in slowing down the full-scale invasion of England by royalist and Scottish engager forces. With Lambert dead, it falls to Cromwell himself and the surviving army grandees to handle the crisis. Even now, however, the situation continues to worsen. By the end of July, the parliamentarian cause had weakened further. Major parliamentarian military leaders such as Colonel John Jones, Colonel John Oakey, and Lieutenant Colonel George Joyce, convinced of the righteousness of the leveler cause, had all defected to the army of the people on August 4th. 
On August 15th, Sir Thomas Fairfax, one of the greatest parliamentarian military commanders, was assassinated by Robert Lockyer, a leveler radical embedded in the New Model Army. Crisis after crisis had begun to compound upon Cromwell and Parliament. Oblivious of what was to befall Britain, royalists throughout the Scottish Highlands rejoiced at the suffering of the parliamentarians, unaware that they were the only thing still containing the army of the people from overrunning all of Britain. Some disgruntled parliamentarian leaders, in their desperation, attempted through backdoor channels to ally with the king to destroy the levelers, but by 1648 there was far too much bad blood between the two factions to accomplish this. On August 18, 1648, the Scottish Engager army crossed the border into England in support of the royalist cause. As parliamentarian forces mounted a defense, parliament itself descended into chaos. With multiple crises now on England's borders, many members of Parliament began calling for unconditional surrender to King Charles I in order to combat the level of rebellion. Cromwell and the army grandees, knowing that this would most likely result in their executions, strongly opposed this suggestion. When it began to look like Parliament was prepared to surrender to the King, on August 19, 1648, New Model Army soldiers under the command of Colonel Thomas Pride launched a military coup, storming Parliament and arresting every member of Parliament not firmly allied to Oliver Cromwell. As Parliament was reduced to a shell of its former self, Oliver Cromwell declared martial law across England and declared himself England's military ruler. While this action allowed Cromwell to harness the full resources of the state for himself, the new military government was enormously unpopular and only increased sympathy for the leveler cause across Britain. Now in partial control of England, Oliver Cromwell moved to defeat the royalist invasion. Although the engagers had enjoyed early success against exhausted New Model Army soldiers in the border regions, their fortunes abruptly changed when Cromwell himself personally led a campaign against them. Cromwell had no choice but to direct the battle himself, with so many of his allies having died or defected. Despite this, his advisers desperately begged him to stay in London. The harvest last autumn had been poor, and because of England's constant state of war, the economy still hadn't even made the first steps towards recovery. Anger was reaching a fever pitch, and if Cromwell didn't stay behind to stabilize his new military government, there may not be one to come back to. Knowing this, Cromwell pressed ahead with his plans anyway, convinced that God himself had blessed Cromwell's righteous mission in England. Cromwell began gathering what remained of his army in preparations to halt the royalist advance in Lancashire. On August 21st, Cromwell and his army set off from London to crush the royalists. Cromwell is famously quoted as saying, It is imperative that we crush the royalists first, then the peasants. For peasant rebellions are a disease of the skin, like a blemish that must be removed. But the royalists are a disease of the heart, and if we do not cure this disease now, we will lose everything to the papists. Unbeknownst to him, Oliver Cromwell would never see London again. Since their victory at the Battle of Holyhead, the Lovelers had fully recovered and cemented their control over Wales. Furthermore, they had opened up a line of communication with the Irish rebels and begun discussions for a future diplomatic relationship. When word reached Anglesey that Oliver Cromwell had departed for Lancashire, Freeborn John announced to the Leveller leadership that the time had come for Britain to seize her God-given freedom and write her own destiny. From this day forward, Britain's only king will be the King of Kings, Freeborn John is quoted as saying. It is said that in the penultimate days before the Leveller invasion of England, Freeborn John had, at last, embraced the title of Leveller that he had despised for so long. The Levellers had spent the past few months growing their influence in the New Model Army and spreading their message across England and Wales, earning the support of the people and the soldiers, all while Oliver Cromwell eroded his support through his increasingly dictatorial actions. Because of this, the majority of Cromwell's army had grown dangerously disloyal to both him and the army grandees. When the army of the people began their fight for all of Britain, Leveller Gerard Winstanley predicted that five million Englishmen across the nation would rise up like a divine wind to carry their movement to victory. Winstanley added that, with the support of the people, what had started out as a mutiny at Corkbush Field had metamorphosized into a force so swift and violent that no one, 
not the king, not Cromwell, would be able to suppress it. On August 24, 1648, the army of the people, now 65,000 men strong, crossed the Anglo-Welsh border with its sights set on London. Leveller Thomas Rainsborough, one of the few leaders to remain in England following the Battle of Corkbush Field, was alerted of this in advance and set Freeborn John's plans into motion. As the Levellers began their march into England, they were shocked at what they encountered. Broken towns and broken people, devastated by war. Soldiers starving or dying of plague, a truly hopeless situation. While the army of the people had prepared for battle, in most parts of England they instead focused on relief efforts for the suffering masses. In many towns, the levellers, whose message had been spread far and wide by dedicated members of the cause at the risk of their own lives, were greeted with tears of joy and celebration. Many New Model Army soldiers, who hadn't seen any pay in years, quickly defected to the army of the people. Just taking a break from the story for a moment, if any think it to be unbelievable that a mass defection from the New Model Army to the Army of the People would occur, I kept in mind, while adding this detail, that the Leveller program was first and foremost written for the rights of the soldiers of the New Model Army. Defection would only offer benefits to the unpaid and low morale rank and file of the Army. This is why I think a mass defection would have been a very real possibility in our timeline had the Levellers managed to grow their power. Now, back to the what if. On August 27, 1648, Oliver Cromwell and his exhausted army began a desperate fight against Royalist forces at the Battle of Preston. Although vastly outnumbered by the Royalists and on the brink of mutiny, the New Model Army, with its superior tactics and training, as well as Cromwell's brilliant strategic mind, was able to defeat the Royalists, with the Battle of Preston ending in a parliamentarian victory on August 28, 1648. However, Cromwell's forces celebrations were short-lived. On August 26, 1648, the Levellers, who'd made immense territorial gains throughout a war-weary and devastated England, had reached London. The two largest New Model Army garrisons left in England, in Banbury and in Bishopsgate, which Cromwell had depended on to defend the city of London in his absence, swiftly defected to the army of the people. Any remaining resistance from smaller New Model Army forces was swiftly crushed by the army of the people, aided by a supportive populace. Cromwell had lost the messaging battle to Freeborn John long ago, and now he lost the real battle as well. Freeborn John understood the spirit of the peasants and farmers of Britain. He spoke to them as if they were his equals, communicating through charismatic pamphlets and arguments based wholly on reason. In retrospect, many future scholars argued that there was no scenario where the Levellers didn't emerge victorious. The people of London had always supported the Levellers, and when the army of the people arrived in London, they secured the city without a shot being fired. The situation Cromwell and his forces found themselves in was dire, to say the least. To the west was a hostile Ireland, to the north was a royalist Scotland, and to the south was an England that had fallen to the madness of a peasant rebellion gone horribly awry. Time was of the essence. Cromwell knew he had to think quickly. Oliver Cromwell began planning an emergency contingency plan that night in the New Model Army's camp at Preston. On August 30th, 1648, Cromwell's plan was revealed to the beleaguered New Model Army. Cromwell's forces, as well as their families, would be evacuated to the New England colonies, which were, according to Cromwell, now the last bastion for God-fearing and moral Englishmen in the entire world. Evacuation efforts began as soon as the remaining Parliamentarian Navy was able to arrive on the coasts of Lancashire. Many soldiers temporarily returned home to England to gather their families for the evacuation. Likewise, many of Cromwell's allies in the upper and mercantile class began preparations to flee the country, horrified by the prospect of Britain under leveller rule. That is not to say, however, that England's entire mercantile class fled the nation. While roughly 70% of England's mercantile class fled to mainland Europe or the New World, a minority of entrepreneurs and businessmen decided to stay in England and give the new government being formed in London a chance. Regardless, the interests of the landed gentry and upper class had largely become irrelevant. The army was in lockstep with the levellers, and with all opposition crushed or exiled, there was no hope of fomenting a counter-revolution that did not involve foreign intervention, which would only bolster the leveller cause. 
In Scotland, the Royalists, who thus far had been severely misinformed as to the nature of what was happening in Wales and now England, began to panic. This panic started when, following Cromwell's victory at Preston, the Parliamentarians never contacted the Royalists for peace talks. Royalist scouts reported that the Parliamentarians were in, quote, total disarray, and that the port cities of Lancashire were in chaos, with people being crushed to death by crowds attempting to board ships. When Royalist spies returned from England, what they had to say to King Charles I horrified him. On August 26, 1648, a so-called Army of the People had reached London. The Parliamentarian soldiers, who were supposed to be guarding the city, let the invading army march right past them. The levelers were greeted by cheering crowds, who began to follow the soldiers of the Army of the People as they began marching into the heart of London. At the head of the joyous procession was freeborn John himself, flanked by thousands of loyal soldiers and a crowd of civilians cheering his name. Freeborn John led the soldiers and civilians down the entirety of the Strand, marching all the way to Charing Cross, where he was met by Thomas Rainsborough, Richard Overton, Robert Lilburn, and Gerard Winstanley, along with the other members of the Leveller High Command. Before a massive crowd at Charing Cross, Freeborn John delivered the following speech. People of Britain, today a new era dawns in our shared histories. Today we proclaim victory over the forces of Oliver Cromwell's tyrannical government. Today we bid farewell to a corrupt parliament, rotten to its core. Today we repudiate the king, along with the ungodly notion that any human being is innately superior to another. Today we complete the work and struggle first begun centuries ago by our forefathers Watt Tyler and John Ball. Today, as Britain citizens look upon the earth gifted to us all by the Almighty God, they are learning to know true freedom. Yes, indeed, that sweet word, that controversial word, freedom. Soon we will redefine what it means to be free. We will do this by tearing down every barrier that separates the people of this great nation. We will raise the children of our nation to know Jesus Christ personally through teaching them to read and write. We will show them the graciousness of the Lord by ensuring that we live following His example, providing for the destitute and the downtrodden. And we will create a new state where every man, woman, and child can live free from fear of harm and want. We will do it not only because we love this great land, but also because God Himself has seen fit to give us this opportunity. I, Freeborn John, present myself to you, Britain, as your humble servant, ready and willing to do the Lord's work and create a truly godly and revolutionary government in Britain, of the people, by the people, and for the people. There is still work to be done, of course. Enemies of the people remain in the north, but they and all our other foes will fail. They will fail, because while they fight for the right to oppress, we fight for the right to be free, for the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The long night is over, and by the grace of the Almighty God, a new era is dawning across Britain. Long live the people. Long live our Lord Jesus Christ. Long live Britain. According to our witnesses, the day London fell, the sun in the sky over the city turned sea green, as if God himself was congratulating the levelers. The report by the spies shook King Charles to his very core. If this report was accurate, these so-called levelers were an existential threat to the system that had governed the British Isles for centuries. Although his royalist forces had been badly beaten by Oliver Cromwell at the Battle of Preston, the king nevertheless announced his intention to lead an invasion force south in one last attempt to stop the revolution from destroying the old order. With Oliver Cromwell and his forces on the run, and the royalists standing alone against a full-scale revolution, the British civil wars had entered into a dangerous new phase. That's where we'll end part two for today. If you liked the video, be sure to leave a like and subscribe. Part three will be coming out soon.